Cryptography has many different goals, but probably the most basic is to ensure that two parties can communicate securely even when the medium between them is under the influence of an adversary. And that's called establishing a secure channel. So as the main thing that one often tries to do in practice, let's start by looking at that a little bit. So what is a secure channel? You have Alice and Bob who are the legitimate parties who want to communicate. And perhaps they do this through email, perhaps through uh, messaging, or perhaps one is a client and one is a server, and we're talking about a transaction like accessing your Gmail account. In any case, Alice will want to send across a message, call it M sub A, and it goes across some medium, but we imagine that the adversary is present there. It can see things and perhaps even modify things. At the other end, Bob will receive something, call it M prime sub A. We now, in this particular context, can look at our different concerns. Privacy is about whether the adversary learns something about the content of the message. Does it learn what M sub A is? Since Bob symmetrically can also be sending data, we have imagined that he sends M sub B and M prime sub B pops out for Alice. And so similarly, privacy would require the adversary to not learn something about M sub B. Why have we put primes on the received messages? Because maybe they're not the same as the sent ones because the adversary tampered with them. That would be a violation of authenticity. Authenticity would require that the messages coming out are the same as the ones going in. Suppose we come to thinking about how to achieve something like this. And we imagine that we have physical resources at our disposal then we can imagine kind of a perfect implementation of security as a pipe. This pipe is made out of some impenetrable material, call it kryptonium. And when Alice puts something in at one end, it pops out unmodified at the other end. So M prime sub A equals M sub A and vice versa for Bob. And given that this material is impenetrable, even an adversary as powerful as Superman cannot violate either privacy or integrity. Nobody can penetrate either see inside the pipe or alter what's sent inside it. Now, as a thought experiment and as a way to think about what cryptography is trying to accomplish, this is actually quite valuable. It's a metaphor and an analogy that we can think of as an ideal representation of what we're trying to achieve with privacy and integrity. And um, we will attempt to approximate it. If we would, but trying, because trying to actually build it, of course, is not very realistic. We're not, first of all, going to construct physical pipes connecting different entities across the internet. And even if we wanted to try, we don't really have any such thing as kryptonite around to do it. So we keep it in mind as a thought experiment and move forward. In a nutshell, what cryptography is about is mimicking this type of pipe. What it does is it uses mathematics and algorithms to encapsulate data at one end and decapsulate it at another end, such that even though now the adversary does have access to whatever is actually transmitted, what's transmitted is not the original thing, it's ciphertext. And despite the adversary's access to these ciphertexts, the two goals we want are ensured. The adversary is unable to violate privacy, meaning learn anything about the data, and unable to violate authenticity. What comes out is either what goes in or an indication that something went wrong. Now, it may seem rather difficult to do this, um, but one of the elements that is involved is the presence of something the adversary doesn't know, which are keys. And we'll see the role of these in, in making cryptography happen. So as we start looking more closely at what the meaning of these goals are, and especially the question of authenticity, as we've already mentioned, it's closely tied with that of identity. If we talk about Bob receiving a message 
from Alice and being ensured that it was sent by her, we somehow need to understand who Alice is. There are many of them out there. There's Alice in Wonderland, Alice Walker, and uh, there's Bob SpongeBob and Bob the Builder and Bob Marlowe and who knows who we're talking about. So um, that becomes an added element of what a secure channel should embody, that somehow it adds some kind of guarantee that, for example, when Bob is performing this communication and receiving messages, he's ensured that they come from someone whose identity he sees as being Alice. And Alice is bound to this identity in some way, and vice versa, possibly. And so we will have to get into what these kinds of things mean. So to do that, we might start by looking at how it works currently in, um, in the non-electronic um, world, where our names are bound to us through documents or law. For example, a driver's license is often used as a proof of identity, perhaps a passport, but many other things like a credit card number, a credit card itself could also be used. And this binding doesn't happen by magic. There's a large infrastructure created by society and economic and financial institutions which performs the binding. And this binding is believed in due to trust in this authority. So the government created the passport or the driver's license, a bank created the credit card. And when I, as Alice, see your driver's license and believe that uh, to be a binding to you, it is based in part on trust in the government that that license isn't fake. And all these issues will arise also now for us in the internet domain. In this domain, what are the identities? On the one hand, there are sort of abstract ones, you might say, like the name of a company, Google or Amazon. More concretely, electronically, they're tied to URLs or IP addresses, like google.com or amazon.com. And we have some understanding that each of these IP addresses is owned by the entity that's supposed to be owning it. When, Bob, when Alice communicates with Bob, who claims to be Google, what they're trying to ascertain is that they're uh, connecting to the real google.com. And so we need to have some way to establish that. And that involves understanding what things like domain names mean and how to bind a domain name to some entity. Exactly as in the uh, non-electronic setting, this is not going to be standalone. It will involve trust in some additional entity. So um, moving forward, establishing a secure channel is the most basic task in cryptography. We will spend quite a bit of time studying it because not only do we want to do it, but we want to do it right. And it's not easy to do. There are many different elements. All of them involve a good deal of thought, formalization, theory, the design of algorithms, the validation of these algorithms, and many things. And in particular, identity will take us into um, quite, uh, quite a space of options. Now, if we want to approach this task in the way I've outlined, which is um, more carefully, the first question to ask is, what exactly is a secure channel? In other words, we want a definition, because without that, it will be difficult and nebulous to know what we've achieved and when we've achieved it. This already turns out to not be quite, quite so easy. To get a definition that's both mathematically precise and useful is, um, is a task that we'll have to look for. Uh, and um, we, will, we will approach that perhaps in, in pieces and, um, and try to elucidate what different parts of it are. So in summary, we seek these secure channels and establish them as the most basic, if not, even if not the only task in cryptography. And we want to do it and we want to do it right. 
Now, having talked of secure channels, questions may arise. One of them is that why are we only talking about the security of data and transmission? A lot of our data is at rest, for example, on servers, and we're obviously very concerned with its security, with its privacy and uh, protecting it from hacking and things like that. And of course, this is legitimate, but the answer is that it's not actually mathematically that different because you can just think of the server as the storage medium, and that's the channel that's under attack. And so the methods are largely transferable. And that'll be something we'll see more broadly that will design methods of ubiquitous use. So, um, of course, there are many other things we'd like cryptography to address, and we'll, we'll come to, to those as we go along. Okay, so now having talked about secure channels in the abstract, let's be more concrete. This will give us a flavor of how people are trying to build them and what uh, the construction looks like and what we face in terms of analyzing it. I often started this class by asking whether you used any cryptography today. Perhaps in the past, people would have been of the sense that, not to my knowledge or something like that, but nowadays it's pretty clear that you you likely did and you know you did. Even if it's early in the morning, the moment you got on your phone and accessed a website, you're more than likely to have used crypto. Why is that? Because most websites nowadays invoke HTTPS. The little s at the end, or the lock symbol here, are indications of security and indications that it's employing the TLS or what used to be called SSL protocols. This is a way of establishing a secure channel and it connects you as the client to Google as the server. And once the connection is established, you send your username and password over that channel for Gmail to authenticate. And then all your uh, email transactions are conducted also over the same channel. Similarly, if you purchase something at Amazon, you will see HTTPS come up and your credit card number is sent over that to protect it uh, from uh, attackers on the internet. Cryptography is, in fact, as this demonstrates, widely used. It goes beyond TLS and SSL. For example, a study showed that over 11,000 Android apps use cryptography something of interest to us as we study this and look at getting cryptography right is that the same study found over 10,000 of these apps to get the cryptography wrong in some way. So there's uh, something to be done both in terms of improving the technology or possibly improving the interfaces or education about the technology. So what is TLS as kind of the main um, face of cryptography for people today trying to do? Well, it's trying to do exactly what we talked about earlier, which is build a secure channel. In this case, most often, Alice is a client like you or me, and Bob is a server like Google or Amazon. But the task is the same. You want to create a way for Alice and Bob to put in messages and have them received at the other end in a way that guarantees both privacy and authenticity and also guarantees identity. You as a client want to know that you're talking really to Google. Um, TLS is not usually going to tackle the job of making sure that Google knows that you're really Alice. We'll see how that's swept into the picture a little later. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at what happens inside TLS. So the first segment is something called an authenticated key exchange. This is a protocol, which means it's an interaction taking place between the TLS module uh, that Alice is running and the one that Bob is running. A few messages go back and forth. And at the end of them, each party gets an output that's a key. A key here just means a short string, for example, 128-bit string. And this key has certain attributes. Alice, at the end of this interaction, 
thinks that it shares this key with Bob, and Bob, vice versa, thinks it shares it with Alice. This embodies claims about identity and authenticity. I know this key is shared with the person I think it is. Furthermore, the adversary does not know this key. It's secret from the point of view of the adversary. Not only does it not know it, but even if it tried to interfere with the flows being communicated, it couldn't influence the key. The key is whatever the parties want, not what the adversary wants. And finally, every time you start a new TLS session, you get a new key. It's not like there's one key for all time, but whenever you connect, you get what's called a fresh key, which means it's there for the duration of a particular communication session. Okay, now so far we've said nothing at all about the data. Remember the job of the secure channel was to take a message M sub A from Alice and deliver it securely to Bob. And key exchange doesn't try to do that at all. It's, it's ignorant of this message. Once the key is established, we use another cryptographic tool called an authenticated encryption scheme to perform the message encryption task. The TLS module will now take a message from the client application, Alice, process that with the authenticated encryption algorithm, which has two parts, an encryption part and a decryption part. The encryption part run by Alice produces a ciphertext. It does this using the key that came from the first phase, the key exchange, the message, and additional quantities, a nonce or randomness or something like that. The ciphertext is what's actually transmitted and visible to the adversary. At the other end, Bob's TLS module applies the decryption algorithm, which converts the ciphertext either to the original message or a symbol called bot to indicate something went wrong. This also uses the key K. We call this an authenticated encryption scheme, the encryption part to denote that it's providing privacy the authenticated to denote that it's also providing authenticity. And how we build these is going to be quite a task, and we'll have to get to that. But the property they have is even though the adversary sees the ciphertext, it won't figure out what the data is or may or be able to modify uh, it other than um, having Bob simply reject by detecting modification. So um, again, we are faced with all this by the incompleteness of the picture with regard to identities. When we said that Alice and Bob behave, believe at the end of this, that they share this key K with each other, who are these entities? Who are the each other? And how does that enter? Well, TLS has to handle this. And now we can leverage our prior understanding of identities. Remember that we want to think of um, abstract entities like corporations named as Google or Amazon as bound to certain URLs or IP addresses and conviction for Alice that she is indeed interacting with that IP address. And remember again that as we said, you would need some kind of infrastructure to, exa to establish something like this. So the, what TLS exploits is something called a public key infrastructure. What this um, gives us is a means for the server Bob to obtain something called a certificate. This certificate is obtained from something called a certificate authority. Think of it like a government issuing a driver's license. There's some authority that issues some certificate. This certificate comes with something called a secret key. That's not something you have typically in when you have a driver's license. It's not part of the certificate. It's something that Bob holds separately. When Bob starts TLS, he provides the certificate to Alice and it goes into the authenticated key exchange protocol. Furthermore, this key exchange protocol needs some piece of information coming directly from the certificate authority, and that's called the certificate authority's public key. And these two additional inputs are used inside the authenticated key exchange at Alice's end. At Bob's end, he uses his secret key, 
And it's due to the use of all of these that it's actually possible for the parties to ensure that the key is shared with the appropriate entity. We can now see Alice's claim a little more uh, detailed as being that at the end of this protocol, I share a key K with someone that the certificate authority has validated as calling themselves Bob. And Bob's claim, if it exists, like I said in TLS, it often doesn't, is, um, is related to Alice. But as this picture shows, it's not symmetric. So Alice does not have a certificate. Certificate authorities can be found out there. If you want to cert, you can go to any of these. Um, each of them has um, different services, ratings on the internet, different prices, market share. And uh, now there are many other options. For example, a very popular one is Let's Encrypt, which is um, uh, easy to use and, and free. So um, when we now think about um, TLS, our abstraction will not explicitly involve the certificate authority and the process of producing the certificate. Those will kind of vanish. But we will think about the public key of the certificate authority and the actual certificate as in the picture. So it's still Alice and Bob, but the set of things involved has been updated a little bit. And that is what we call the cryptographic core of TLS and SSL. So of course, there's a vast amount of machinery and implementation and additional functionalities and options that surround an actual protocol. What we call the cryptographic core is a mathematical abstraction, but it represents where almost all the cryptography happens. And it's not something simple. We will have to put a significant amount of work and effort into figuring out how to make this work. All its different components, its different goals, and so on. So we will start in particular at the bottom end, we will study authenticated encryption. In order to do that, we'll have to build up a whole set of tools and primitives and ideas before we can uh, define and analyze specific authenticated encryption schemes. And once we've done that, we'll move to public key infrastructure and authenticated key exchange. And all that will take a fair amount of time. A complete study of all of this is uh, many weeks in length. And that shows how much is actually going into TLS. One question we omitted, remember, um, only the server Bob had a certificate. This makes sense because Bob is um, conducting uh, a business usually, there are transactions happening and as an entity of that form, it goes and gets itself a certificate. But maybe individual users don't do that. Nonetheless, there are many Alice's. We want to authenticate Alice in some way. So to complete the picture, we should say a little bit about how that happens. And the answer is that it's not part of TLS. Rather, it's the job of the application to perform that authentication. So at some level, here, we don't need to talk about it. From our perspective, TLS provides unilateral authentication. Only Bob authenticates himself. But looking closer, how is it actually happening? Well, inside the record layer, the record layer is the term given to the authenticated encryption part, which is where many, many messages flow back and forth. Alice will authenticate herself simply by sending her username and password to Bob over this encrypted and authenticated channel. And so the application running at Bob's end, which has invoked TLS, will authenticate Alice. Okay, now having um, talked about how TLS is involved and, and subtle and how much effort the cryptography takes, one might hope or expect that this has all been well done. Um, but the history of TLS shows a, a large number of violations of security in the form of interesting attacks. 
which um, have compromised many different aspects of the protocol. And they keep appearing in the news and, uh, and uh, we keep uh, um, having to make modifications and patches and things like that. It's interesting to examine the attacks that have been found and try to see what aspect of the design led to flaws because after all, TLS embodies way more than cryptography. There's a lot of implementation aspects and a lot of deployment aspects. There are many different implementation out, uh, out issues out there and so forth. There are many issues that go beyond what we've discussed here, many systems attacks, all kinds of things. So all of these play roles. Um, there are, for example, things relating to cipher suites, which didn't come up in our little picture, um, and other um, things which are at the boundary of the cryptography and, and, um, and the security elements. Um, but it is worthwhile to note that a lot of the attacks are, are on the cryptography. And in fact, there's a lot of, or was a lot of crypto in TLS that wasn't of such great quality. Part of the reason for that was historic or legacy. The first early versions of TLS tried to use whatever crypto was around, but there wasn't at that point a very great communication link between cryptographers and designers of TLS. And so perhaps it wasn't the best cryptography that was used, or perhaps the type that was most needed didn't exist. And this led to some early issues. As time went on, these bonds grew stronger. By the time we got to TLS 1.3, there were very close connections between the cryptographers and the TLS designers, which have led to what we hope is a much sounder protocol now. But here we are looking at things historically. Some of the attacks pertain to different kinds of system vulnerabilities and uh, practical issues. And um, one of the lessons that emanates from this is that uh, we see an evolution in which the design and systems and the cryptography move closer together. So as we look at these goals, we start pushing the cryptography to model and capture a greater number of the real world threats. And we design the crypto to be better and better to address those threats. So in any case, our takeaway from all this is that really our concern in the class is going to be this cryptographic core. So in some ways you might say it's not so much TLS itself that we're going to be looking at, but the task of designing a secure channel in the TLS framework which means it's cryptographic core, which means a model in which we want to think about uh, secure sessions created by an authenticated key exchange followed by authenticated encryption. We will try to do this, understand the goals, get it right, not necessarily in the way exactly that TLS did it, possibly through different tools and different mechanisms. Okay. So one thing to appreciate is that every time you go to some website and you see that little lock symbol or the HTTPS, appreciate that there's a ton of stuff going on here. Uh, there's a host of cryptography and implementation and security issues happening under the rug that we take for granted. And our attempt to figure it out will be quite involved and time consuming. And providing some kind of way of doing this is, um, is, is quite a big goal for us. Okay, so um, we can pause here. And um, what can we take away from this? Well, um, if nothing else, that TLS attacks have certainly been good at finding interesting names, haven't they? All your SSLs are belong to us. Heart bleeds and various kinds of dogs and and the number 13 is now lucky and all kinds of things. It's fun to look at those attacks. But now we'll go on to, to something quite different.